All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation. CP from Knicks Fan TV on the check-in. Special guest with me tonight. He is the co-founder, director, and executive producer of Street Dreams Magazine, a famed street photographer. And for most of you that have seen the new Knicks commercial for this 2020-2021 season, he and his team worked on the production and photography for that commercial. Dope commercial. I love that commercial. Uh, Steve Sweatpants. Steven Irvy, yeah. a.k.a. Steve Sweatpants. Steve, how you doing, bro? Yeah, pleasure to be here. You know, I'm humble. That was, uh, yeah, I be I be trying to do a lot of stuff. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's an honor to be on this joint with you. Uh, my homie's been putting you on for a long time, so yeah. this is just... This is like the next fan moment for me. So, yeah, this is a pleasure to be here. Much appreciated, man. And, and I love your work. And uh, like I said, happy to have you on. So um, first, let, let's start off with, with your history in the Knicks fandom, man. Take me back to your earliest memories of being a Knicks fan and how you became a, a fan of the Orange and Blue. Uh, so for me, um, my pops wasn't a Knicks fan because my pops was so busy trying to, you know, make him make some make some money. Yeah. So my mom was the Knicks fan, so she okay. was the one who put me onto everything. You know, she she was crazy about John Starks and 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 you know the team back from the early '90s with Ewan and all them boys. Uh, the uh, the Allen Houston in the '90s and, and the late '90s teams with Spreewell and all of them. So like me and my mom is you know go hands in hands as a Knicks fan. So if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be you know riding so hard riding so hard with the Knicks in the first place. So I remember like you know. Be, even being able to go to the garden for the first time, being able to shoot photos, the first person I hit up was my mother. Like I didn't hit up my pops, yeah. I didn't hit up nobody else but my mom because she would be as hype for me uh, and you know just as hype in the situation at the first time. So it's been I'm 34 years old now. I've been an Knicks fan since like early 90s. Yeah, it goes back now. It's been it's been time. It's been some time. Same same here. Same here, man. Who who was your favorite player? Man, I had a couple. You know. Uh, Mason was one of my big Mason's favorite players growing up. I was a big Mason fan, like you know, the bully on the block. Uh, he came to my went to Thomas Edison, uh, Thomas Edison High School, okay. same high school with Stephen H. Yeah. And I remember like Ed, Ed, Anthony Mason pulled up to our school, so that was hype. Uh, Allen Houston is forever my favorite, one of my favorite H2O. basketball players. Yeah, um, I would call him an internet friend. Uh, one, it's still to this day one of the most purest jump shot forms you will ever see in your life. That's a fact. Uh, and you know, I, I can't hold you. I really love the mellow years. I mean, even though he's not with the team anymore, I I was you know just as hype when he was on the you know on the team rocking out sixty points and all that. So you know, mellow is my guy, even though he's not with the team. Yeah, no more. mellow, he's mellow, like mellow's been my favorite player since he stepped on the court floor at Syracuse. Straight through, I've, I've been a yeah. mellow fan. And as you said, you know, obviously those years didn't work out. We wanted to have more success. Knicks tape was a great year. You know, that Knicks tape team was my we last are? like favorite team man you know that they had a cast of characters and mellow playing at an mvp caliber season i love that team it, it, it's kind of crazy that we in 2020 uh 21 right uh 2021 right now and that was almost 10 years ago you know yeah. what i mean i remember when the, the whole hype and it just kind of feels you know it's kind of surreal that it was not you know it was already like a decade but that that mellow jr team <laughs> that was some of the peak the, the peak of my hipster life was uh, watching those dudes go ham facts facts man um mason was my guy of those 90s teams uh i'm my yeah. family's from jamaica so ewing was like you know that was uh, a centerpiece you, you know how people in that house had the the picture like mlk jfk jesus you know what i mean like <laughs> patrick ewing was like next along that line you know what i mean and that really got because you know with, with jamaicans man i don't know if you grew up around jamaicans or not but they're very yep. prideful in their countrymen no matter what they're doing you could be a teacher a doctor track and field of course but basketball yep. patrick ewing was king Patrick Ewing so was I grew King, up so in Rosedale, Jamaica Queens. So like that, that was that was his era. So he had the yeah. whole Jamaica Queens on lock. So you couldn't go nowhere. You go every single dollar van up and down on the block. <laughs> yeah. you know, every elementary school. Yeah. My, my barbershop I used to go to out in Rosedale for two forty third definitely had the OG posters of Ewing. So yeah, yeah, not it, it ran it ran deep. It ran deep posters. That's you know, that, but, that's but a fact. Ewing, that's a you fact, know, he, man. He's forever like, he's icon, you know. For saying? sure, for sure. Yeah, those 90 teams, it was really Mason Ewing, Starks was my guy. You know, Starks was, it was fire and ice, you know, between Starks and Ewing, <laughs> and, and Mason just brought that style. He was so, um, you know, athletic for his size, and, you know, the way he could, he was the point forward. 
Mace was the point yeah. forward, man. And and yeah. I'll never forget in the finals uh, when he had to guard Elijah. You know, Mason had to D up Elijah. He did the dirty work off, off the bench for that Nick team. So, yeah. man, Mace was my guy, man. Rest in peace. Yeah, RIP to the legend. Yeah. You know what I mean, uh, I mean, I could go on for days. Larry Johnson, I can't, I feel remiss without saying Larry Johnson, even though, like, you know, we, you know, he, he definitely played. He played a lot in the, at that point in his career. But like, you know, every I was a big Larry Johnson fan. So like, you know, LJ on the team. Yeah. Like, you know, the Mark Jackson years. Like, honestly, I could go on and on. Like Earl the Pearl. I mean, I haven't seen him play, but that's my guy. The, one of the smoothest brothers of all time. Like, the the New York the New York history of basketball players. We have such a, a eclectic history of basketball players. Uh, and, and just love for the city that they all have this their own kind of style that like, you could kind of pick your generation and like what kind of swag do you want to go with? Sure. Do you want to go with the Earl the Pearl vibe? Do you want to go with the Mellow vibe? Do you want to go with the, the, yeah, the Mason? Yeah, uh, hundred percent, man. Earl the Pearl was definitely Earl, Clyde, and Bernard were the three guys who I really wished I would have seen in their prime. You, you know what I mean? Like Bernard Earl the Pearl great. was a legend on both the the black top. And inside, you know, he, he held it down Black in, Jesus, in Baltimore. Man. Black Jesus. Black Jesus held it down in Baltimore. There was legendary tales when him and Brill, Bill Bradley went at it, you know, back in the Baker League yeah. out, out in Philly. So, uh, yeah, shout out to Earl the Pearl, man. Legends. Absolutely. Yeah, legends. now I have a, I have a Bernard King photo hanging up in my wall right now because that's another one. I would love to see Bernard yeah, King go crazy. Yeah, but... would have loved to see Bernard go crazy, man. What was your, I guess, your favorite moment? In, in Nick's history as a fan, there's so many. <laughs> uh, man, uh, it's kind of cliche, but I can't I can't help but not say it. But the, like that shot Allen Houston hit against Miami Heat, that teardrop, like yeah. I, I haven't been so hyped to see something like that in my life. I think that was to this day one of the one of the times I've never been so so excited as a Knicks fan. I remember yeah. run, running out the crib, running down the block. Uh, seeing something like that, me and my mom running around jumping like we just won, like we won the championship. <laughs> it was getting yes. out that series alone. Those Miami Heat series was so taxing. It was like watching Game of Thrones. Yes. You know what I mean? Like yes, bro. Early before the last season of Game of Thrones. You know what I mean? But like those, th- there was epic tales. You know what yeah. I mean? So it was so fire to watch those teams go crazy. So uh, that that has such a permanent spot in my mm-hmm. mind of it. Like. It's just being such a dope series, and then honestly, what, remembering uh, JR uh, Smith's six man six man year was yeah. some of the most elite Nixing. guard play that I've ever seen. Yeah, he went ballistic, you know, and I, went I, I, that's honestly my favorite. Yeah, it was Woodson, crazy. It Woodson was, got Earl to lock in, man. JR really went in that year, and um, as you mentioned with with Houston and them, that's what I miss about the game today. Even though I still love the game, the ri- the storytelling through the rivalries back in the 90s, from beginning to end, especially us with Knicks Bulls, Knicks Pacers, Knicks Heat, you can't replicate that. And it was real life. You know, the story was being told chapter by chapter, verse by verse in (laughs) real life. You know what I mean? You could not make it up. The beef, the, you know, Riley going out of Miami and building a carbon copy of the Knicks and then them going head to head, the brawl, and then Houston having that shot. You know, it was was incredible, man. Incredible days. that's what keeps me a fan to, to this day, to be honest with you. I mean, like, kind of, like, it kind of, remi- it kind of reminds me of, like, um, it was just like, uh, it's just like watching, like, uh, I'm a big nerd, so I always refer to all this stuff, but it's like no different from watching, like, a Dragon Ball Z joint. It's yeah. like the Knicks had that craziest saga of all time it's to get to the build up, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was the saga continues to this day. Yeah. I got blessed with a chance to go to the Super Bowl 50. Uh, that were like Peyton Manning and Cam Newton. Yeah. Uh, I was like with Peyton Manning versus Cam Newton, mm-hmm. and um, I, I was sitting one goal, one row behind the field goal post, and then I saw Pat Riley in the tunnel, and I dead ass asked him, I was like, "Yo, can you come back?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I mean, in the middle of the Super Bowl. I mean, Beyonce just finished performing, I'm yeah. like, I, I, but we have real questions. No, we need to and talk. He, you know, even though I, don't, I knew he's, I knew he's gonna say no, but it was still like I, this was that was my yeah, shot. So. That was your shot, man. That, that <laughs> you, you see the success he's had with Miami. I'm, I'm a little bit jealous still, but it is what it is. You know, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, so, uh, what was what was your what was the moment that hurts you the most, man? Ah, man, when uh, when Bello got blocked by Roy Hibbert <laughs> and the playoff series. <laughs> Ugh. Uh, we have Roy about, Hibbert looking like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, fam. What happened, bro? His 2K man. rating went to five. Man. That game. I don't know what happened. 
I'm me, me, me and the homies always every once once every other week we bring that up. Like, what happened? What like, happened, you know, still, bro? <laughs> like, still trying to figure it out, bro. Um, and then I just had to say this for my mom too. Like, she's still sick about the Houston Rocket game where she swears that you know they goaltended. Like, he put his, uh, I think Elijah one put his hand in yeah. the basket. <laughs> so I had to say that for my mother, or she would be sick. Yeah, so, those two goaltending joints. Like, we got. I, I gotta go with. I gotta go with those two. Obviously, the suspensions that came out of the the ward and and uh pj brown fight definitely pissed me off because the knicks were going to lose that series um obviously losing in in seven in 94 that one hurt as a little kid i still think the whole oj thing had something to do with it i think it just threw us off a whole juju but um for sure everybody was watching the game i mean the game i mean the bronco going the game within the game (laughs) <laughs> and as a kid, I'm like, nah, this got to be on another channel. I'm flipping through. And I ain't have cable that time, fam. So I'm going through 2 through 11 a hundred times over looking for the game. And like, what, what happened, bro? Yeah, that. I'll never forget. Never forget. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then the, the whole Hibbert thing, man. That that thing just, that hurt. That one that one hurt when Nick State went out in flames like that, man. Yeah. You know. We've been building that. We've been building ever since. It's been taking some time, but we've we've you know we we looked our wounds. You know, yeah. I think we're ready to go. Facts, <laughs> but, facts, but facts. Those are those, those still. You know, I will never forget those. Those yeah. stuff mark. Um, and and you mentioned before that that you ended up getting a job with the Knicks. Tell me about that. How did that happen? And and what was that experience like for you? So it's kind of crazy for me because uh, you know. That's something like I didn't go to, you know, school for, I didn't go to like art school. I didn't go to college for like photography, stuff like that. So a lot of this stuff is like very self-taught and like on the fly. So I'm just super humble and appreciative Mm -hmm. just to be able to be taking photos in the first place. Like it beats working at GameStop. Like I can't, (laughs) too bad I don't got no stocks in GameStop. (laughs) But besides that, like, you know, there's, um, you know, there was really no other way for me to really make a name for myself. So I really grinded my way up, you know, just being myself and talking about my experiences in New Yorker and, mm. the, be, you know, not scared to be about talking about the black experience. And they really gravitated towards that. So one day, like, it's been like three years ago now, like maybe 2017, mm. um, I mean, like 2018, actually, that they reached out to me uh, for Black History Month. And it was mm. like, you know, we would love for you to come to the garden for three games to take photos for Black History Month. And I thought it was a spam email at first. I was like, this is not even real. So I was like, this is actually happening. Yeah. So when I go to meet the team and speak with them and then like got to tell them like, you know, I'm born and raised in New York and mm-hmm. got to really, you know, just share my story with them. And, you know, the fact that I've been a fan for, you know, since I've been in my mother's womb pretty much, mm-hmm. you know, they really just gravitated towards everything. And we just started off this really dope relationship. And I remember like soon after we finished those three games for Black History Month or three years ago, uh, they immediately asked me, do I want to go on the panel with like Alan Houston and and uh, two other people. I was like, you want me to talk with Alan Houston? I on can't a- remember. Like, it was, it was sense to me. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about, you know, but um, they just always been super receptive and always been super, um, you know, just super supportive of me for over the last three years. And, like, and that's something I would never, you know, in a million years to say that like, I'll be working mm-hmm. with the Knicks. Like, yeah, I've been being able to go to London with the team. I've been yeah. able to, you know, work with them for opening nights and been able to, you know, just document like, you know, the highs and lows and just pretty much the whole experience uh, that I've, I I couldn't be more grateful for. So like, I, I wish, I wish it was, I wish it was something crazier, but they really just really reached out to me through the gram and like, through the gram and through the emails. Wow. And like, and it was just, <laughs> it's, it, my life has pretty much changed ever since. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Man, your, your hard work has paid off. And I definitely want to touch on your journey um, in, in a bit. Do you have a, a favorite moment or favorite story when covering that team, you know, interacting with the players and, and the coaches? Uh, I think my favorite, my favorite moment was uh, the first time I got to go to a team practice. And that was during that first, the whole first stint mm-hmm. with the uh, being able to document the team. Um, at first, it wasn't a, it wasn't a part of the deal. They were just like, you know, you just document the games, and then you know we'll be able to use it for social media and all that stuff. But then as the games are going along, they say, like, hey, would you mind coming up to a practice? I was like, no, hell yeah, you know, I'm down. Like, <laughs> I will I will make it out there. So I, I get to the practice facility, and then and, you know this you know this is something like that's the stuff I really want to see. Like, I want to see the locker room. Mm-hmm. I want to see the practice mm-hmm. facility. So seeing like all the like the banners with like the Busher and Ewan and like all the OGs up there, and then being able just to see you know, everybody just, you know, just in their element. Like, yeah. it was just mind-blowing to me. And, and Alan Houston pulled up to me and just, and just started talking about, like, just, like, with a regular conversation, like, super humble, mad chill about it. And I was like, is this is, 
this is not, I mean, as a fan, like, I can't even imagine what it would be like, but like, I'm here actually, you know, working, you know, working at the same time. I was like, this is actually mind boggling that I could just chill with Allen Houston and, you know, just, and you, you just chill yeah. and talk about basketball, you know, and talk about photos and like, you know, yeah. and other normal kind of stuff like that. And between that one and going to the London and going to London with the team, I, I got to go to the NBA London games in 2019. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I got to fly on the plane with the players and like, it, that was crazy. And, and then we got to like chill with Earl of Pearl and like, you know, just chill with him and like, just talk normal. It was just yeah. like, just doing normal things with like the people that I really admire, yeah, you know, yeah. it's just like something idols, I man. never really could know. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. You know, can't really thing. make it. I, got, I, could, I could talk for days about yeah, <laughs> yeah, all hey, the experiences, that's, hey, that's, that's why we here, man. That, that's why we here. I got it all day, man. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Kylo Quinn was a, was a photography enthusiast, man. Did you give him any pointers? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, well, no, he's good. He, he got it. He got it. He got it. He got, he got it on Smash. But I remember, um, like I've always like he was always super really, you know, super receptive to me being recorded. Like every time you see me taking photos, he would like, I mean, he would always, you know, point up the, uh, you know, just point to you like saying what's good. And yeah. And he's a Queens kid too. Queens. So, like, yeah. I was able to talk to him about Queens. So, uh. It's just like it, yeah. It's just really dope to be, and I'm, I'm usually older than a lot of the players now. Like even though I look like I'm like a <laughs> solid twenty eight sometimes, yeah. like so, it, it kind of is like it's, it's just always like this interesting kind of like you know back and forth. But you know the, you know it's just. It's just like, I, I honestly just can't put it into words. It's like one of the dopest things I could ever do. Dream come true, man. Definitely a dream come true. Um, the current day team, what, what's your thoughts on what, what we're working with now and, and the direction that the team is going in? I genuinely feel like this is, you know, especially being able to see the team, you know, not only on TV and just seeing them in person. Like, this is the best I've seen the team look since like those 2012, 2013 years. Like, mm-hmm. I haven't been optimistic about our team in a long time. And, you know, it's just because not only is the the coaching, we, I think all of the Knicks fans have been saying the same thing, the coaching direction and there's the overall foundation with like Leon Rose and everything that they've been building out is you can see, the, you know, you can see the proof of concept actually working in real time. Like, yeah, the fact that we drafted up to get um, IQ was probably one of the most clutch things that we could have done for our organization mm-hmm. for the next couple of years, you know, so I I. I love our guard play. I mean, I know that, you know, we have our ups and downs, but the fact that we're 8 and 11 right now, you, you, if you ask any Knicks fan right now, like about 20 games in, like what would you be mad at your 8 and 11? Like anybody, all of yeah. us would take that. You yeah. know what I mean? So, uh, this is the you know, half glass full all the time, but like this time, like I feel like <laughs> some days I feel like we might make it to the play. I mean, you know, we might make it to the playoffs. Other days, like I'm not too sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I feel like, <laughs> but, but I feel really confident. This is the most the most confident I felt about I seen, uh, like I said, in Danny a decade. Man, let me tell you, I don't know if you were listening to the show when we when we shout out to five and three, boy, but there was fans calling in. We're making the playoffs. I'm not going to work tomorrow. <laughs> we nice. Let's go. Oh, I'm like, I mean, you know, to, it's crazy, but that that's the passion of the fan, man. Like a five and three start, best start since Knicks tape. And, you know, you got people jumping out the window, like, beside themselves, man. It was, it was a fantastic moment. You know, they come back to earth a little bit, yeah. but I'm with you. I, I would sign up for 8-11. and 11. You're seeing clear improvements from Julius Randle. I think you're seeing improvements from Mitchell Robinson on the yeah. defensive end. As you said, Emmanuel quickly, who they were able to um, flip Marcus Morris to the Clippers, end up getting quickly. So that yeah. was a great move by Scott Perry before Leon Rose and them got there. And yep. and uh, I like yep. the direction that that I like the foundation that they're building, as you said, under Tibbs and with yep. Leon Rose. So far, it seems uh, like it's working out fairly well, and and the young players are, are are gravitating to it. And so that's all you could ask for. It's gonna take time for things to come together, but uh, I'm with you, man. I think Randall to me has been the the biggest surprise in how he's playing and really uh, real. making the team better. Yeah. Making the team better. A lot of us, a lot of us was just like, man, like we were just looking at the time, like, is it, is it time for him, you know, to us to really reevaluate if, if we want this brother to be here or not? Yeah. Because like <laughs> all of us were just trying to really figure out like what was going on. But like, man, this if he's not an all star this year, then th- that is the biggest snub, yeah. you know, easily of 2021 because he's been playing some of the most elite basketball that I've seen pr- probably for his career, especially, you know, holding the way for the team. You know, I, I had to give some love to Kevin Knox. I'm not a, I've definitely been dogging him for a while, but like yeah. Kevin Knox has played some of the most aggressive basketball that I've seen play like since he's been on the Knicks. Like this is just a really good team to see the good energy out there. And 
man, I really do hope we make the playoffs because I'm trying, I'm trying to see some, I'm, I'm, hey. I'm trying to see some playoff hey. basketball. We need it. Me and, me and you it. both, man. It, it would make my show even better. So I, I would love to see that <laughs> and see the fans be excited. But uh, I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I think everything will work itself out, but getting in the lottery wouldn't be a bad idea either. You know, with, with Dallas potentially folding in and the Knicks having their own lottery pick, that could be, you know, that could be a game changer this draft as well. So, We'll, we'll see what happens there, man. Um, your photography journey, as as we said, we, we kind of finished with, with your work with the Knicks, but let's start back to the essence, man. Like, how did you even find that path towards your passion for, for photography? Man, uh, that was like four scores, seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that's kind of crazy, honestly. Like I, like I said, like I, I didn't go to like photography school. Or I didn't go to art school, or anything like that. I went to high school at Thomas Edison. Like I went to uh, the first. Day, I went to school for computer repair, and then the, my teacher told me on the first day of class, it's cheaper to buy a new computer. So, <laughs> like my whole kind of trajectory of uh, career path has been yeah. ever since on a journey. Um, I know that's like the word of the day, but like um, my pop started off as an electrician. Um, and you know him being a black electrician with his own business, like you know that meant a lot to me growing up. And mm-hmm. when I, I really wanted to make sure that I could do what I love. Like he did what he loved as well too. So, mm. uh, and like I remember, like Instagram came out, and like you know there was you had access to like you know taking photos on your phone and everything like that. I've always kind of been into family photos and like making sure that like I was always been a part of like you know the streetwear community and stuff. But I never really had access to just really just buy a camera because I mean I was working at GameStop, I was working at Express, I was working at Sears, et cetera, et cetera. Like I, I wasn't making no real money to buy a camera. But when the iPhone came out and then Instagram, you know, it just gave me a different kind of access level. So I kind of hopped into like you know hopped into it immediately, and and I kind of fell in love with the world of photography. So I didn't want to be a poser. So I kept the I had the iPhone with me, and then I bought a a film camera off of Amazon for like fifteen dollars, and like. And then I just kind of went crazy with that and really been able to like build myself within the community, like uh, learn from other photographers and kind of like, you know, go back and forth with that because, you know, a lot of us are self, you know, I'm self-taught myself, but a lot of us yeah. are in our, in our photo community out here in New York. And it's just been a, it's been a really bumpy road of taking really crappy photos for a long time to taking halfway decent photos now, you know what I mean? And yeah. uh, I, the last job I had was at REI, the one at Soho. And I remember, um, I used to get fired from being late all the time because I would just be taking photos too much. <laughs> on, on the way to work? <laughs> just stop. On the way to work. You see one of the homies like, oh, what's up? Like, yeah. you, know, you want to go down over here and take a picture? Like, oh, yeah, sure. You, you know, I see, you know, you're like uh, 30 minutes, an hour late. But then I told him, I told him like, you know, thank you when he fired me because I could actually mm. focus on street dreams. I could focus wow. on, you know, I could focus on my photography career. So I had to sleep on my own couch for like 18 months, but that was wow. when I was able to get my my first passport. I was able to, really start to be able to travel because I had the time now I could actually focus on my, my whole journey. So, you know, if it wasn't for street dreams and like yeah. the conception of that and uh, the whole photography career, you know, I, I, I wouldn't know what I would be doing right now. I'll be on my couch watching the Knicks. <laughs> 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 Honestly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Nice. So, so going back to that, cause you, you said you had to sleep on your own couch. You were subletting yeah. the room in your apartment to so this room. Yeah. This- Apartment. I mean, I had to sleep on pretty much on that couch, right? Not the same couch, but yeah. like in the same area. And so I had to sell, I had to yeah, sell my room, sleep on my own couch, so I could be able to, you know, like just be able to like actually take this photography thing seriously, yeah. you know. So and that and was, was that was to life. friends, or that was like through Craigslist, you know, like a random person. I had some random dude who worked worked at REI at the time. Like he's a bozo now, but like God bless him. You know what I mean, <laughs> but like I let him, I let him take the room. You yeah. know what I mean, and then. The like, there's always a story of a roommate carousel in New York, so I definitely had to play the same carousel for sure. with subletting my room a little bit. So for sure, but you know that 18 month period was the time where I got my first big coach, um, my first big job with coach, and I was able to mm. go to London. Like I li- I've been in New York my whole life. I wasn't, I'm not to say that we don't travel, but like I never had a chance to go overseas or something like yeah. that. So so really being able to get a pass, I didn't have a passport. You know what yeah. I mean? So so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. well, I was saying it really opened a lot of doors for you in, in terms of um, just opportunities and, and travel, right? Well, what was your your favorite city that, that you've done um, a project in? Uh, it was a, it's a tie between uh, Tokyo and Cuba. Because mm. Tokyo, uh, Tokyo was really dope because I, I got to go over there um, to document like, a sumo wrestling match. 
So, mm. uh, you know, there's not a lot of black people who was watching a sumo match, super wrestling yeah. match in the middle of Japan. So being able to be in that arena felt like being in WrestleMania. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it was, really dope. <laughs> it was really dope to see it and like just experience it. And, uh, yeah. you know, it was something, it was like one of those, one of those memories that you will never forget. And, and I went to Cuba a couple of times. Uh, I went to Cuba with Sony because uh, I'm, I'm signed to Sony as one of the uh, photographers on the Alpha Collective, been mm. signed to them for the past uh, four years. And then they send us on trips sometimes. And one of the trips, well, pre-Rona. Mm. So uh, they sent us to Cuba for seven days. And then they, I was able to chill in Havana and Vinales and all that stuff. Nice. And it was like one of those kind of experiences that you expect one thing and then you know, you can get, you, you get it completely blown away with a whole nother kind of experience, but uh, just how nice the people are, how crazy the architecture is, and yeah. just like how beautiful the city is. Like, it's all that sappy, romantic stuff that you see in the movies. That, Classic like, cars it and really, all it that, really, yeah. yeah. You know, like, nah, this is not it, so. And it's just being a black a black man from born and raised from New York to experience these things, like people are, have this kind of energy to you that's so warm that you just don't expect. Yeah. Like, people will come up to me and be like, Oh, you from Brooklyn? You, know, you listen to Jay Z, Biggie? I was like, yeah, 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 it's yeah. Was like, it was just really dope to like you know, going back and connect. Forth and yeah, so connect. It just makes you really levels. Cool. you start to travel like that. Yeah, for sure. That that's dope, man. That's dope. How how would you describe like your overall style? You know, just kind of going through your your portfolio. I see a lot of um, you know, human interaction, a lot of people rather than you know, architecture and things of that nature, and a lot of black and white. You know, how how would you um, describe that and how you kind of establish that as your, you know, your look. Yeah. It's, it's always kind of really hard to find a style. Like, I think that would be like with anybody, like mm. even if you were playing basketball, like what kind of style do you want to play? It's the same thing mm -hmm. with like photo photography, like what kind of style of photographer you want to be in? You know, me being born and raised in New York, I always just try to find ways that how can I be really true to myself without, you know, faking it. And then the things that, I was raised on, I was raised on, you know, just being raw and emotional. I was raised off like, you know, hip hop. I was raised off of like understanding my history and being really in tune with that. So that's why I kind of gravitate towards like black and white photography because I kind of get all of those kind of emotions at, at one time. Like, you know, the reason why I focus on simple interactions is, you know, people always forget to do the simple things in life. You know what I mean? Like, so I always try to focus on those, those little kind of moments of like, you know, of the contemplative thought, you know, because you know, those those are the little things you just don't you you don't really notice. And the last thing is like I just really I think it's really important to just show um not just the most honest truth that you can in this world where like information is flying all over the place. So mm -hmm. I, if I could tell you like my honest perspective as you know who I am and where I'm from and, and, and what I'm looking at at the time without being biased is like that's the best way to do it and not trying to be exploitive about it. So you know I I always try to look at it as like I really uh, I'm documenting like I'm really documenting the document history right now with what's happening, like whether it's like with the homies up the street, whether it's the, you know, the Knicks game, whether it's the, if I get blessed to travel, like if we get to start traveling again, mm -hmm. um, it's really like some real time history thing for me. And I'm really just trying to keep, you know, everything flowing and, and cohesive. So it doesn't feel like there's ever some like, it never feels phony, you know yeah. what I mean? So like, that's the one thing I always want to make my work to make sure that it always feels authentic and it's authentic. never like, like, yeah, just some kind of, some hula nanny, some fake shit, you know, <laughs> like, I just don't want anything to do with that. Yeah, I, I hear that. I hear that. And, and when you say, you know, keeping things simple and, and do, you, do you feel like, because you said back, back when you really started to get into it, you know, you and your family used to take a lot of pictures. Do you think that had any influence on, on your style now? A hundred percent. Because like me being cool with my mom and being cool with my pops and like, you know, me annoying my sister my, all the time. It just makes me really like, I really love my family, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I think that kind of aspect kind of, you know, kind of you know, it bleeds into all these other aspects of my life, you know, especially when it comes into my work. So when it comes to me taking photos, like I kind of gravitate towards like those family moments of like, you see like, you know, a pop, you know, showing his kid, like, you know, showing his kid the basketball game at the garden or something like that. Those, I would look for that before I would probably look for somebody dunking the basketball sometimes because like, that's something that really kind of resonates with me, you know, and, and that's something I want to communicate. Like, I want to watch the game too, but like, sometimes it's just really dope to see the fans interactions because everybody is just so enamored and just happy to be there. You know what I mean? So it's always like this interesting kind of balance of taking that same kind of energy from, you know, the court to the streets to, to wherever I am is like, finding like these really dope family moments and 
you know, making those cliche kind of Kodak moments, like, you know, being the fire in the wall to actually see like real, you know, people, people being real with each other. Yeah. That, that, that's dope, man. Um, very, very excellent, um, perspective. This year was, was very tough, man. Um, for humanity as a whole, for our society as a whole, you know, uh, you have the coronavirus, which, which we're still, you know, actively dealing with and over the summer and so on, you had, um, the, the protests and, and things of that nature. And, and you were out there in front with, with the camera yeah. and the lens. What was that like, you know, from behind the lens and, and also in front as a man, as you're kind of seeing all this unfold right in front of you in the streets? It's crazy. It sometimes is hard to, um, there's, there's a lot of moments where you, you know, when you're in the middle of a protest, especially for me, I grew up with my parents being very, uh, my mom's, my mom's from Brownsville and she always, you know, talk about Brownsville never ran, never will. So that's kind of like embedded in your blood. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, even like, even though I'm from Bush and Grace and Queens, like I still have my mom's Brownsville roots. That's really tied, you know, close to me. So they went through a lot of, you know, they went through a lot of different oppression in the seventies and mm. all the things that they used to talk to, you know, talk to me about. I feel like I got to see it happen in real time from everything that she's been telling me for, you know, pretty much since I've been like 12, 13 years old. So I felt like when it, when it started to happen, like, I felt like this is my time to actually tell my truth now, you know what I mean? Mm. And it's, it's, it's overwhelming, you know, there will be, there will be times I'll be taking photos and then next thing you know, I forget to, that I'm, I forget to take photos. I'm, I'm chanting with everybody else. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like it's hard, it's hard to kind of, and, and it's not to say like you had to pick, you know, pick like a way to like kind of like act, but it's like, it's so much emotion that you're downloading at the same time. And especially when you understand that we're here in the middle of a pandemic talking about you know, some something that we've been, we have so, something that we've been arguing about for the past 100, yeah. 100 plus years. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? So, it was there was there was times where it feels like kind of like a, it felt kind of a, I don't I wouldn't say depressing, but kind of sad. But then there was a lot more moments that felt way more empowering. Like I never, there's never been a no matter what you think about the whole movement of Black Lives Matter, like the the term itself, it felt it's really it felt really powerful to see that you know from for miles and miles and end that my life matters on the sign. You know what I mean? Like I have never seen that, you know, ever, you know, so everybody just wants to acknowledge that, that at that one point. So there was a lot of powerful things that happened and I just, I, I'm happy that I'm still alive to be able to tell it because you know, this, it, it, was, it was, you know, it was going down over there. There was a lot of serious- a lot of tension, man. A lot you know, of tension in the streets. Situations. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it was one of those things that like, I feel like an old man already. I feel like that they, they age me <laughs> 70 years when you experience <laughs> something like that. So like, man, back in my day, we used to riot, you know, uh, it kind of felt like that happened already. But it was like, I want to say once in a lifetime opportunity, but I feel like it was something that I, me personally, I had to experience firsthand. So like, I knew what happened. Like going back yeah. to what we were talking about earlier, like I could tell my truth and not be able to tell a perspective of what I actually saw myself rather yeah. than what I saw on the news. Yeah, and, and for you to be able to capture that, you know, through through your lens, I, I think that that's very interesting, man. Very, very interesting. And well, um, ho hopefully things get better and, and with a lot that's going on in the world, man, because we, we, we certainly could use it. So it's a lot of heavy stuff going on, no doubt about it. Um, you know, you, you had said it, I was listening to, to one of your TED Talks, and, well, the TED Talk that you did at, um, at Rutgers, mm -hmm. and you said there was four kind of principles that have kind of carried you through life thus far. Uh, can you kind of expound on, on that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the four principles, like the four principles that I kind of, I really hold true to me is, is uh, the first one being individuals are greater than algorithms. Like to me, like if anybody takes the time to just watch the social dilemma, just even if you want to watch 15 minutes of it, it has a lot to do with the way that I feel about, uh, and this is not sponsored by Netflix, you know what I mean? No ad, no ad. <laughs> but uh, but, yeah, but it, has, it, it talks a lot about like how, you know, how a lot of these companies are, are really predicated off of dictating a lot of these algorithms so that they can make the best to keep you on your phone or to keep you tapped into whatever they want you to be tapped into. But I think that, you know, whether you're a content creator or you're just a normal person that's just trying to get along, you just need to understand that like you are dictating what happens mm -hmm. in your whole atmosphere, whether it's through your phone or whether it's through your Facebook or whatever, you know, whatever that is. So I'm always really conscious of to like find some time for myself so I never lose 
track of who I am, and so I don't get lost and just lost in the Twitter feed yeah, or lost un- in the Reddit feed. The Matrix a little bit. Just unplug for a little bit, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, and I, and that was hard, but you know, yeah. I, this is like I don't want to be a hypocrite because, I mean, I love my phone just less than it's just the next person. I watch YouTube. I'm going down every single YouTube rabbit hole you can think of, but yeah. like, there's always a time to kind of tap out to really, you know, kind of center yourself. So, and or, especially if you want to make it some some kind of happiness, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, because the whole thing of my TED talk was don't live to pay your rent, and what I meant by that is like, you don't have to. Uh, don't live to do temporary things. You know what I mean? Like just find something that you could really love that you could really manifest and, you know, the financial security and all that stuff. I'm not saying like you're going to be rich the next day, but like the, the, the mental stability is way more important right now, especially for everything for sure. that we're about to go into. For sure. Um, the other, the other one, I, the other point I brought up was uh, precise persistence. So like, for me, like, uh, if I, if I, if I told anybody when I was 18 that I was going to be a photographer, like people would straight up laugh in my face <laughs> because that, that wasn't even like a, a thought, you know what I mean? I was too busy playing basketball in like 64, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I, was, I wasn't really trying to do anything like that. So the, it was really with the persistence of like seeing how my pops was going, waking up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., going to work as an electrician. Like I thought he was a maniac. I, I do the same thing now for the love of photography. I'm waking up. You know, I wake up you know, butt crack of dawn to make sure that I can make sure I could get to my gigs and make sure I could, you know, do everything. And that's because I love, to, you know, I love what I do. And I've been doing that for a long time. And, and I feel like the precise persistence is it helps me uh, stay level headed, you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, and make sure that I don't, you know, just don't get too far off it. But at the same time, like, I know where my goal is. Like, if I want to focus on photography, like, let me focus on this. Like, yeah. if I wanted to focus on doing my laundry, <laughs> like, <laughs> let me focus on doing this. Like, let's, let's knock out the goals and like, just actually uh you know set a path to it and i forgot the third one i know it's indiv- individuals that algorithm individuals are greater than algorithms mm-hmm. precise persistence don't live to pay your rent chase your mortality was it, was mm-hmm. it chase chase that's mortality. the most important one chase your mortality. yeah you know what i mean like it has a lot to like even like the, the fact that what you're doing with Knicks fans tv i mean this is something that you love but you know what i mean when you look back in 20 years you'll be able to see all like the dope conversations you had the highs the lows like you know it's real time yeah. documentation of you know what's happening that's so yeah. that's the same kind of way that i look at photos you know what i mean like this i'm chasing that kind of immortality because like once you produce it like it lives forever you know what i mean so it, it stays in that kind of digital space or it stays in people's you know it stays in people's hearts and minds the people that are tapped into it so you know that that would be for anybody that's for anybody who really loves their job like if you want to if you was a custodian like be the illest custodian ever like you know being being known on the block is like i mean you know that's the guy over there like i, yeah. I feel like that same kind of case um i'm not like i said i'm not pretentious when it comes to any kind of per, any person's job like I just just if you love it then i will be i will love it as well too and then you will see uh you would just see like the folk tales to start to grow out of it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like my, my grandpa was the truck driver. He was like one of the illest truck drivers. Like people over there talking about him, like he's Nino Brown, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> but he, he just did his job well and people respected him, you know what I mean? And, and he, and he loved it. And, yeah. and then that's the same kind of thing that those, those are the same kind of principles that I carry. And those are the four joints that I, you know, that's, I hold, hold that, close to my chain. That's dope, man. So when, when you, when you talk about, you know, precise persistence and, and not, uh, you know, living just to pay your rent, as you're sitting on that couch behind you 18 months and, and you know, the, the revolving door roommates is coming in and out. Like, did, did you ever waver? Did you ever think like, yo, man, I, I got to figure out a plan B or... I am not going to lie. No, because I really... I've worked... I've, I've, I was... I got to the point where I was so tired of, you know, selling a membership for somebody. Like, I wanted, to, like, people to invest into me, you know? It's like, I, I, how many times could I go down this path of, like, you know, keep on getting these jobs where... if It's one thing if I liked it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I never liked any of the jobs. <laughs> like, maybe that was bad. Like, maybe, maybe the next one was going to be it. Who yeah. knows? You know yeah. what I mean? But, like, it wasn't working out for me at that point. And I just knew that, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'm just really hard-headed when it comes to the fact that, like, I don't, I, I don't want to work for anybody, but I will work with you, you know? Mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. that was something I really needed in my life. So uh, working with people has been th- the best, the best thing ever. Like I, but I don't like to work for anybody, you know, like I, th- there was a big difference. That's what I needed to separate in my life. So I needed that sanity, you know, yeah. uh, I was like about 27, 26 at the time. And I was like, I'm, I'm not, 
I was like, I just can't go back to, I couldn't go back to REI selling tents, being like the black dude in the middle of Soho (laughs) selling tents. This ain't gonna cut it. This ain't cut it. Stuck to it, man. Stuck to it. it. Shout out to everybody that was over there. (laughs) (laughs) There's still dope people. (laughs) So good Good vibes. Nothing but good vibes. That's what's up, man. Um, and, and you mentioned, you know, unplugging. If, if, if you're not taking flicks or you, you're not on the gram or you're not editing, well, what are you doing to kind of unplug from the Matrix a little bit? Oh, man, I need to unplug more. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm thinking about it. I was like, I haven't been unplugging nothing, dog. Like, yeah. I've just been trying to play cyberpunk, honestly. I've been, I've been really focused with my PlayStation. So, like, I've been, my escapism is really high because I'm a big nerd and it's cold outside right now. So, yeah. like... For me, I just had to. I had to finish this damn game. I've been playing this for so long now, and these and they got the glitches and everything. Yeah, <laughs> it keeps on it, it giving has to be hiccups, but I'm so close. I'm so close. Um, but honestly, it's just really dope to spend time with my mom. You know, um, so cool. my uh, my parents. My parents have been. Uh, my pops had, had uh, four strokes last year, so oh, sorry, uh, yeah. I'm not last year, but like, so no, thank you, appreciate it. And he's still he's still thugging it out. Like you know, he's. Um, he still survived, like, even though, like, he's just been through, you know, something that obviously that's super traumatic. So, you know, being able to chill with them and there's, you know, I mean, the, just to go, like, post up and watch Die Hard with my pops and then, you know, yeah. order some Uber Eats for my mom. And, like, and then honestly, just, like, you know, just just chill with her and just you know, bother her, bother my sister, like the like every other annoying big brother does. That's, like, the most kind of quiet time I can have. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, that's the kind of best way to, you know, plug. Some simple things, as you said, man. Simple things, and and uh, really seems like family, family's guy. a center. Yeah, yeah. That, that's dope, man. That's that's dope. Street Dreams magazine. To tell the people a little bit about about Street Dreams. Street Dreams. So we've been doing Street Dreams now for just about like six, uh, six, seven years. It's kind of crazy, actually. And you know, the whole concept of Street Dreams is, you know, we never really had an, any opportunity to get our work published from anyone. You know, it was really hard, especially when you first started up and like in the early Instagram era of like early two, 2010s, mm-hmm. nobody really was going to publish your work, especially if you didn't have any kind of, you know, any kind of networking or anybody who knew you or you didn't have, you know, just kind of how it goes in any kind of industry like that. So uh, during this whole time of, you know, of us trying to really get our work published, we've just been working with so many different photographers through the community. Like I was linking up with a bunch of different uh, early New York photographers and a lot of us are still friends to this day from like, you know, shooting on the iPhones and like going on rooftops and like going into abandoned buildings. Like we were on some real like OG graffiti vibes, mm. like especially like the early IG community with mm. us. So um, when he had, when I heard from my barber, which is always good to be cool with your barber <laughs> that like, there was somebody in Vancouver. Like that's the main rule of everything. Like that's be cool fact. with your barber. That's a fact. Make sure your um, relationships is good with your barber. They know. They know people. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, so my barber, um, AJ. So shout out to AJ all day. Hopefully, he's probably, he's probably listening. He's probably listen to this. Um, he put me on to uh, one of my business part, my business partners to this day, mm-hmm. and he was like, oh, you know, these dudes. Uh, before I had any kind of followers on Instagram, maybe I had like. like maybe a couple of thousand. Um, I was just still like writing my own kind of captions, or, like you know, with my own kind of New York soliloquies and putting up my own kind of photos. So mm-hmm. people always be seeing my random captions going with my photos. And it was starting to grab some people's attention. And one of the people's attention to grab was from Vancouver, apparently. So mm-hmm. uh, AJ is like, oh, you need to meet this guy. You know, he really, you know, really likes your work. So next time that he throws a little party because AJ was, you know, he's the plug. He had his own studio. Mm-hmm. He had his own thrift store and all this kind of stuff like that. You know, he said, next time I throw a party, you know, I can meet, you know, I can meet Eric um, at, which is on my business partner. I can meet him at the spot. Mm-hmm. So I was able to meet Eric. He spoke about the concept of Street Dreams Magazine, like pretty much the next day after the meeting. And then I've already been meet, meeting with all these different photographers from New York. And he already knew a bunch of people from Vancouver. Um, so we pretty much merged that idea of saying that like it was going to be a, first a magazine with just Eric and myself's work, but we, um, I decided to make it a magazine with all the homies because like, you know, I want to give a chance to everybody that never had a chance to get their work put in, like, this, especially we've been mobbing together yeah. in the snow and doing all this kind of different, like going to bend in buildings and it just, it would feel, I would feel guilty to drop a magazine and be like, nah, 
Forget y'all. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. Check yeah. out my drink that we're killing together. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would never do that. I, I'm not a snake like that. So that was pretty much the inception of Street Dreams. And around the same time, like, we thought it would be a good idea to have a hashtag where we can uh, group everybody's photos under it so we can all kind of see it as one community. And we decided to start the hashtag called Street, uh, the hashtag street Dreams Mag. And we started that, like I said, like around seven, six, seven years ago, and it's grown to like 12 million shares now. So oh, wow. we've been able to share with people from all over the world, been yeah. able to do galleries, you know, before the Rona hit, like we've done, done galleries in Tokyo and, and uh, Vancouver, Toronto, uh, Montreal, New York, you know, like LA, yeah. Chicago, you know, we've been able to really, you know, spread the love of like the, our street photography community because we look at it on some like a punk rock hip, a punk rock hip hop community kind of vibe of like, you no, know, we just here to like, we don't care what you look like, as long as you're here to like, as, as long as you're here with the goods, like yeah. that's all that's that matters, it. you know that's what I mean? It. So we've been able to really hold that group. Yeah, now that's dope, man. It's dope that you've been able to grow, for, you know, cultivate a community around around your passion as well, man. So uh, that, that's excellent work and, and just seeing how you yeah, stuck you. to it, you know, stuck to it and, and uh, living your, your truth and, and living your passion. Um, I think it's very inspiring. Hopefully we were able to in inspire some people here tonight as well, man. So definitely appreciate you sharing um, your journey. Um, so yeah. so what, what's next? What, what's next for you and, and Street Dreams coming up 2021? Man, I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> 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 uh, this is, this is going to be a really busy week, actually. Um, I can't really talk about what I have planned tomorrow, but I definitely have a really big shoot uh playing tomorrow with Nick, so uh, you guys be on the lookout for that. It's definitely going to be up really soon. And we got a, a really a lot of dope uh, activations uh, going on this season with uh, myself and the Knicks that we really hyped about. Um, but going into, going into this year, I've been able to, uh, we started like Street Dreams Radio. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been able to work with a bunch of our favorite DJs and producers and we're going to go 10 times more harder with that because, you know, just as much as I love photography, I love music just as much. Mm -hmm. So um those go hand in hand so and we dropping out our our you know our own our, our podcast with that uh with all the music joints that we'll be talking about so just really amplifying everything that we've been doing is going to be really important because uh you know i'm, I'm not trying to live in a four-bedroom apartment no more i love it here i love my roommates <laughs> they're, they're, those are my family <laughs> for real but uh you know it's, it's about that time so uh, I need to go. <laughs> yeah, understandable, man. On, onwards and upwards. One step at a man. time. Yeah, one step <laughs> at a time for sure. One step at a time. But listen, man, I, I love this conversation. Definitely appreciate you um, coming on and joining us. Hopefully you call in the post game, man. I got to hear. This is the next step, man. I got to hear from Steve Sweatpants. Oh, I'm calling. After a Nick game, I'm what's calling. your thoughts? I'm going I'm to give you the floor. There's no time limit, no nothing, man. Just let me know. I'll tell my guy to look out for you, and, and I'm going to get you in first, man. No question. Oh, no, nah, don't hype me up. I'm calling in. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm only calling in on the W. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it's hard for them losses, man. It takes a lot of patience, man. But, you know, we, we hear all the same, man. We, we definitely hear all the same. Um, drop your, your social handles and, and let the uh, let the fans know where they can find you. Yeah, for sure. So, uh Thank you again for having me. Honestly, yeah, no it's been really an honor. And I know I'll talk really fast. I'm, I was really excited to be up here. Like this is you know, shout out to Canarsi, shout out to the Flossy, shout out to the Bush, <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Jamaica Queens, Rosedale, like, <laughs> Rochdale. <laughs> sky, you know, what I'm saying people die. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, my handle is sweatpants. Uh, S T E V E sweatpants. Like yeah, like the actual sweatpants. Mm -hmm. And my company is called Street Drinks Mag. So you can find it both on IG and uh, on Twitter. On Twitter, uh, I have the same name, Steve Sweatpants. And on IG, our 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 for Street Dreams is Street Dreams N Y C. So um, you can always hit me up. I'm usually really responsive. Just don't say something weird to me. <laughs> and I would get spicy, which you do. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, now it's all love and uh, and. Uh, no, nah, honestly, I'm happy to I'm happy to be on here. Appreciate you. No, no doubt, man. Um, yo, you know what? We, we didn't even get to that. How did they even call you Steve Sweatpants? Where did that name even come from? <laughs> yo, so that's that's been a running joke that me and my mom had for a long time because my mom used to uh you know, she's like she's a, a typical straight 
your mother, you know, in a very loving way. So yeah. every time that um I had to do a chore, like, oh, she's like, Steven, wash the dishes. I'm like, oh, yeah, let me go put on my sweatpants. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would go, like, procrastinate and just go hide somewhere. Yeah. And then I, anytime I had to do homework or anything. So when it came to, like, when I got a little bit older and, like, you know, starting a whole Instagram name and, like, in this new digital space, I was like, what am I going to call? My first name was Trill Bellamy. And I was like, nah, this is, <laughs> people were calling me Trill, like, for short. And I was like, this is not going to work. I was like, I need to think about, like, Something that, that that's me. And yeah. then I, I thought about my mom, how she used to make fun of me wearing sweatpants all the time. So I call myself Steve Sweatpants. But it, it means that I like, I like people to be comfortable around me and I like to be comfortable. So that's yeah. what it pretty much means. All, all, coziness. all makes sense, man. All makes sense. Well, like I said, my guy, definitely appreciate the time. And uh, good luck with everything, man. Good luck and Godspeed, man. Thanks yeah, again. Yeah, likewise, bro. All right, Yo, man. Take I'm gonna it call, easy. I'm going to call y'all soon. Yeah, please do. Right, please. please do, man. Thanks, bro. 